السنة مثل سفينة نوح من ركبها نجا ومن تركها غرق السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله الحمد لله الذي أرسل رسوله بالهدى ودين الحق ليظهره على الدين كله وكفى بالله شهيدا وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمد عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين أما بعد As to what proceeds with the fadl of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we meet again for our weekly meeting to conduct the study of the book known as Al-Usul Al-Thalatha the three fundamental principles by the noble scholar Al-Imam Al-Mujaddid Shaykh Al-Islam Muhammad Ibn Abdul Wahhab Al-Tamimi Rahimahullah Ta'ala Currently I believe this may be the is it the eighth or the ninth lesson on the eighth or the ninth meeting Wallahu a'lam Bissawab But before we start to study the book due to the many requests of the from the brothers and sisters uh, with regards to shedding light on the importance of seeking knowledge ahmiyatu talab al-ilm and its virtues wa fadlihi and its etiquettes wa adabi we decided to go through some issues which are incumbent upon the seeker of the truth and the seeker of knowledge to be acquainted with therefore we decided that before we start this book we need to understand and we need to comprehend many issues so therefore we decided to have a preface known as a madkhal before we start to study this book and I believe and I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that the previous lessons and meetings have been beneficial for what the students have acquainted and have studied so far with regards to somebody asking about note taking then we have not got to the part of how a student of knowledge should sit in the majlis of ilm and how a student of knowledge should take notes and how he should study with the people of knowledge we have not come to that issue yet but very soon we will come to that issue once we have covered the more important issues which take precedence over this issue which has been mentioned by the system. So previously we were discussing Ulumul Maqasid wa Ulumul Ala. I mentioned to you students that Al Ilmu Shari Islamic knowledge 
the foundation of Islamic knowledge. With regards to understanding it and comprehending it is based upon the correct comprehension and understanding of the Kitab and the Sunnah. And this includes that a student of knowledge seeks and studies that which will aid him and assist him in achieving that goal, which is at tafaqqu fil kitabi wa sunnah, having the correct understanding of the Book of Allah and the Sunnah of Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We have come across the hadith before where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam narrated where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said the man yurid illahu bihi khayra yufaqihu fi al-deen a marfu narration that if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for whomsoever Allah wishes good Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grants that person the correct and the true understanding of the deen. I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he makes us amongst those who are seeking knowledge that our understanding and comprehension of the book of Allah and the sunnah of Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is identical and in accordance to the understanding of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the Sahaba ridwan Allah alayhi wa jma'een and the Salaf who followed. May Allah make us from amongst these people. So based upon this, we understood that ulu, the different sciences, once again by the people of knowledge have been divided into two categories. Ulum al-Maqasid and Ulum al-Ala. Ulum al-Maqasid, like I previously mentioned, are those subjects who have a connection with beliefs, actions, submission, contemplation, and taking heed. Just like Ilm al-Aqeedah, Ilm al-Tafsir, Ilm al-Hadith, Ilm al-Fiqh, Ilm al-Suluk, Ilm al-Jaza, Ilm al-Fara'id, Ilm al-Sirat al-Nabawiyya, and al-Adha wa Ilm al-Adha bi Shari'iyya. So the core subjects, and we studied last week with regards to the three categories that we studied, which Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah mentioned. Do you remember the categories which Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah mentioned, which were three? Or have you forgotten? So, Ulum al Maqasid are those core subjects that a person studies, the major subjects which a person wishes to study and must. You know, when you have a degree in a university, you have the major subjects. And you have other subjects which are less in importance, but important, important from a perspective. So, from Ulum al Maqasid is Ilm al Aqeed, 
علم التفسير علم الحديث علم الفقه علم السلوك السلوك is behavior how a person should conduct himself how his ethics the morals of a person علم الجزاء as we know what Shaykh al-Islam ibn Qayyim rahimahullah mentioned that al-jaza is to know your end with that which you will be requited with al-jannah wa jahan either paradise or hell ilm al-fara'id is inheritance Ilm al-Sirat al-Nabawiyyah is the study of the biography of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and Ilm al-Adaw al-Shari'iyah learning the Islamic etiquettes uh, these are considered to be core subjects Al-Ulum al-Ala are those subjects which are studied which are sought that aid and assist the seeker of knowledge to master and perfect ulum al maqasid so in other words ulum al ala are like tools they are a medium they are an intermediary in order to achieve and obtain the goal, the goal. so they are considered to be wasai in order to obtain and achieve the goal for example mustalah al hadith in order for somebody to be able to be competent and understand the ahadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he must study Mustad al-Hadith. And these ulum al-ala, these subjects that are studied, aid and assist the student to have a sound understanding. How many of you study the Arabic language? But I don't know that if it was ever broken down to you that why you study the Arabic language and under which category does the Arabic language come under? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned in the Quran in Naja'allahu Quran in Arabiya la'allakum ta'atuhu So al-ulum al-lughawiyya linguistics ilm usul al-fiqh usul al-fiqh usul al-tafsir mustalah al-hadith and other subjects are all considered to be from ulum al-ala they are tools and mediums and they are intermediaries in order for you to master the core subjects which are considered to be ulum al-maqasid and i believe this is what we were discussing last week from what I understand. So now many of you know today that why you study the Arabic language. The Arabic language is from min ulum al It is a tools and a means for you to be able to master ulum al maqasid so for example, if you don't know the Arabic language, you cannot understand the tafsir of the Quran and the words of the Prophet So the question that I would like to ask the students is that have we understood the definitions of Ulum al maqasid and Ulum al ala and the differences between them with the examples that were given. So all of us, we need to know 
the Arabic language, which is a key component and a an important subject to master. And the Arabic language, ulum al is rust. It has many subjects. But it is a means and not the end. It is a means to understand ulum al Now the discussion after knowing this where we really stopped up, which is going to be our discussion today, is the question that needs to be asked is when a beginner or when a student of knowledge starts his journey to seek knowledge that a student of knowledge who starts his or her journey to seek knowledge, a new student of knowledge, somebody who has the aspiration of seeking Islamic knowledge. And this student now has been made aware of ulumul maqasid and ulumul ahl. The concepts have been defined clarified, explained, and elaborated. So now this, this student of knowledge who is new when it comes to seeking knowledge asks the question, which category do I start with? Do I start with ulum al maqasid Dive into and start studying aqidah and tafsir and hadith like many do? Or do I start with ulumul al Those subjects which are key subjects which act as a tool and a medium and a key when it comes to ulumul maqasid. This is the question. So there are those amongst the people who say that you have to start with ulumul al, the tools and the means. And there are those who say, no, you have to start with that which is obligatory, the core subjects. And from amongst them, ilmul aqidah. So there is a discussion that has been going on for quite a while. But we need to know the answer, the correct answer. Because if we don't know the correct answer, then our path of seeking knowledge may become difficult for us. We may be clouded. And that's why you find in the West, particularly what I have seen, and this is a trend oh, that you have, you know, when a new class starts, regardless of whether it's free or it's a paid course, you see a lot of Western students. And when I mean Western students, I mean Western Muslim students from the West. They're all hyped up. And they just enroll onto the course. And then they start studying the course. And after a few weeks, you see the numbers drop. And then they, are dis they, they, they disappear. They vanish. Some get fed up. Some say, I can't do it. It's too difficult. The reason or the cause of this is, is that because the picture has not been made clear to such students of knowledge. So a lot of people get fed up when it comes to seeking knowledge. Seeking knowledge, talab ilm becomes a burden. You know when you have your mobile phone in front of you and you're on your WhatsApp or on your social media, 
uh, was it platforms. A person could stand on one feet and probably have no issues surfing or if flying back to messages or being on the internet for two hours. But when it comes to seeking knowledge, the first 15 minutes are fine and okay, or 10 minutes. And then after that, the students, illa ma rahimallah, except for whom Allah has mercy, start fidgeting. Start looking onto their phones. And then, then the minds are traveling. The body is in class. But the mind is in Dubai. On the beaches. Under the palm trees. Or is at work. Or whatever preoccupies the mind which that person has an interest in. Illa marahim. In the end, we find that many, they give up seeking knowledge. They, they, they become fed up. They can't do it. They say it's too hard seeking knowledge. Now, the reason for this is not because seeking knowledge is difficult. It's because they have not got their priorities right. They don't have somebody who can guide them. Mentor them. Like we were mentored and guided by our scholars, our teachers, alhamdulillah. We were blessed. That's why we reached where we are today. Due to referring back to our mentors and our teachers and consulting them and not trying to fast track when it comes to seeking knowledge. So we have to understand this concept that there is no such thing as fast tracking when it comes to seeking knowledge. Seeking knowledge is like a ladder. You have to climb the first step before you can move on to the second step. You can't jump onto the fifth or the sixth step. This doesn't happen. Maybe it can happen in engineering and medicine or any other subject. But when it comes to the inheritance of the Prophet ﷺ, then this is not possible. It is for this reason that it took us eight to nine lessons today to get you to this point so that we can have this discussion. So I do not see those who have come to me and who are studying with me that they become prey or they become from amongst those who start hating knowledge rather than seeking knowledge or they are not able to taste the sweetness of seeking knowledge. So the question is, which is given preference? Ulumul Maqasid or Ulumul Alad? The answer to this question is, fiha, that the student of knowledge begins with the Mukhtasarat, the abridged and the summarized texts which have easy sentences to understand. Sahlat al Ibn fi ulum al Maqasid in the first category, which is the core category, which is the core subjects of Ulum al Maqasid. That's what we begin. And this is exactly what we have chosen. We have chosen Al Usul al Thana. There are three fundamental principles. And we know that there are two books. The first book is Al-Usul Al-Thalatha and the second book is Thalatha Al-Usul Wa Adillatuha The three fundamental principles which was written by Shaykh Al-Islam Muhammad Ibn Abdul Wahhab Rahimahullah Ta'ala 
for intermediary students. Mubtadi'een, not with the ayn, not innovators, but with the hamza. Mubtadi'een, lil mubtadi'een. And uh, yesterday night I was, after teaching al uh, al I I came across a risala or a letter or a clarification that was written by Shaykh al-Islam Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab rahimahullah ta'ala son Abdullah Abdullah bin Muhammad bin Abdul Wahhab rahimahullah ta'ala and Abdullah ibn Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab rahimahullah ta'ala when he was writing this clarification clarifying to the people that we do not expel people out of the fold of Islam, nor do we hold that the blood of the Muslims is halal, except for that which Allah has permitted, permitted us with. He mentioned something which was, which caught my attention, where he mentioned that al-usul al-thalatha, we haven't come to the title of the book here. We haven't even reached the biography of the Sheikh, but this is now related as we are talking about Ulum al Maqasid that Al Usul al Thalatha is a book from the subjects of Ulum al Maqasid. It comes under Ilm al Aqeel. He said that this was written for the Ami, for the common folk, for the, for the beginners. Although that this book, another title for this book, as we have, as I have seen on the manuscript, is Ta'alim al-Sibiyani al-Tawheed. Teaching children al-Tawheed. And it makes sense that the first thing that the children should be taught is al-Tawheed. And the first thing that a student of knowledge, a seeker of knowledge, who is a new beginner, he must start or she must start with Ilmul Aqeedah and in Ilmul Aqeedah in the branch of Aqeedah or in the discipline of Aqeedah or precepts or tenets that student of knowledge must start with a tawheed and when he starts with a tawheed he must start with a mukhtasab which is a summary and which is easy to read and comprehend and understand and that is Al-Usul al which is an mukhtasar, a summary and an abridgment of Thalatha al -usul. So now do we understand? And this was not only for the children, it was also for the Amatims. Now, so a beginner in the path of seeking knowledge is like a child. And there is no shame for us. I don't know why an individual was a bit shamed of when he said to me that I teach like I'm teaching children. <laughs> well, if you understand Ulum al Maqasid and Ulum al Alat and you understand what we have to say to them, you'll understand the Naam. The students ought to be treated as foundational students. What is it? You have a foundation and then you have an intermediate level and then you have an advanced level. Yes? Are these the three levels that you have at, when it comes to studying a subject? Am I right in saying so? The foundation, the intermediate and the advanced. So this is what the student of knowledge starts with. And now when you look at Al-Usul Al-Thalatha, for those of you who have access to Al-Usul Al-Thalatha, you will see that Muhammad, Shaykh Al-Islam, Muhammad Abdul Wahhab Rahimahullah Ta'ala's book is very easily understood. It's an abridgment, it's a summary, and Sahlatul Ibar. It's even somebody who's learning the Arabic language will be able to pick bits up and understand it. So this is what the student of knowledge, the beginner, who's at the foundational level. So we have Al-Muqtadi'un with the Hamza, 
the foundation, the foundation level students. We have al mutawassitun who are the intermediate level students. And then we have al mutaqaddimun the advanced level students. Each category has its own books and own approach and methodology and way of seeking knowledge and what books should be selected. Am I making any sense to what I'm saying? al mubtadiyun al mutawassitun and al al mutaqaddim these are the elements so you start with a concise and summarized text which is easily understood and all of you if you want to read the arabic and the english and this is why i request I kindly and humbly request all the students, and I have now decided that we shall read the text of the book both in Arabic and English. And I am pretty sure, with the permission of Allah, that many of you will be able to understand most of the text, especially when you have the translation in front of you. Because it's the style of, of the book it's very easy to understand. So this is what the student of knowledge does. A student of knowledge, he starts with a text which has been summarized, abridged in ulum al maqasid so that he is a, so that the student of knowledge, this beginner, student of knowledge is able to perceive the issues in a good manner. And then the student of knowledge engages himself with that which is the most important and the most beneficial and virtuous for him. So that's how he starts. He starts with Ulumul Maqasid, just like you're going to now start studying Al Usul of Thalatha. Inshallah, I hope to finish this, these discussions very soon. But I believe that these discussions are very important before I just start teaching you the book. There are some certain people who out there do not even know that there is a difference between Al Usul of Thalatha and Thalatha al Usul. And they are teaching these subjects out there. And they just go straight into the book. But that can't happen here. Because that's not how I studied with my teachers. So I'm going to teach you the, the method, the, uh, the, the, the methodology. I'm going to adopt the same methodology and the same manner in which my teachers taught me. It might upset a few people of saying, oh, when are we going to start the book? You just, you know, the Fikar is just blabbing away, prolonging his lessons. But that's not the case. These are important issues and factors which I mentioned. Now, I recommend everybody to have the Arabic copy. And I recommend, and I say it's obligatory for all my students because the text will be read here in Arabic and then translated into English and everybody should read the text in Arabic. And to the extent that we will appoint some sisters who are proficient in the Arabic language when we have our a tutor who teaches our sisters the Arabic language and she will I hope that she will uh, accept this offer of mine where we will provide workshops for our sisters to read text to those sisters who are proficient in the Arabic language so they get a feeling of the actual text now the book will be explained with an explanation there is no shah of al-usul al-thalath 
but I will explain it. There are many shuroh for Thalathatul Usul. But like I mentioned, Thalathatul Usul wa Adilatuha is a different book. We're studying Al Usul Thalath, which I will explain. So, going back to the issue, is that once the student of knowledge chooses his or her path by that text which has been selected and chosen, which is from Ulum al Maqasid, and it's an abridgment and summary, just like in our case and in our journey, which is Al Usul al Thalatha. Then the student of knowledge starts to study a subject which is the most suitable and the most appropriate for that student of knowledge from Ulum al Ala. From Ulum al Ala. And what would be a very good subject in everybody's opinion to study? along with Al-Usul Al-Thalatha would be the Arabic language. Medina University Book 1. Alhamdulillah, the, where the, uh, the sisters' classes are just about to start. start. So it's a good, it's, we have a good timing, Alhamdulillah. The Ilm Al-Maqasid and Ilm Al-Ala are going to be adjoined and Alhamdulillah they're going to be integrated with one another, hand in hand. Also with regards to the brothers, then we have our Arabic tutor that is available. If you want to study with him, then you can contact and study. You can contact us and we will put you in touch with that brother who teaches. He's one of our students as well. So those of you who have been selected from amongst the sisters to study book one and those of sisters, I believe 28 sisters, Alhamdulillah, successful passed their written and their oral exams for book one. And now they are going to be moving on to book two and we have a, a, quite a few sisters who will be studying book two as well. So this is Ilmul Maqasid and this is appropriate to study, which is very important. To, to choose that which is befitting and which is appropriate whilst studying a subject from Ilm al-Maqasid. So what does the student do when he starts to study um, Ilm al-Ala, for example, Medina University Book 1? And uh, I remember just before the lockdown, uh, our share, um, the Rahman al Adami, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, uh, I was having private lessons with him. So, Alhamdulillah, every Thursdays, I would, I would go to the Sheikh's house, and the Sheikh would teach me on a one to one, which he doesn't do for. I don't think he did for any of his uh, recent students in the Haram. I was probably the only one that was blessed by Allah for this opportunity after waiting almost five years. So for five years, I pleaded to my teacher to give me that opportunity to teach me and for me to read some texts to him on a one-to-one -one. and for five years, he made me wait. And we only had about 30 pages to finish the book which we were reading, although we read a lot of other texts whilst we were reading that book. But then the lockdown kicked in and SubhanAllah, I spoke to the Sheikh a few times on the phone. And then the Sheikh Rahimullah passed away. But whilst I was at his house, the, the, the reason now, five years to get a private lesson. Some people, they want to study with you for 
two, three weeks, and they send you a message, can you teach me prayer? <laughs> we have to wait five years. And it wasn't just a five years of just waiting. It was a five years of pleading to the Sheikh. Every time I saw him privately, and I would whisper in his ear, Sheikh, you're going to give me that chance to study? He said, no, I'm too busy. After a month, I would go to him again. And this continued for five years. Until Allah granted me the opportunity to study with him alone. So we were, I was studying, it was that Thursday, I remember, just before the lockdown and I was there. And we, we had our lesson in hadith, ulum al-hadith. And then he had a visitor who was his ex-neighbor. And that is the author of the books which you study, Fa'a Abdul Rahim, who was previously the neighbor of Shaykh Diyar Rahman al -Abuni. So he came to see the Shaykh, and I was there. So there was a three, the three of us in the Shaykh's house. And, you know, we started to talk about the Arabic language because uh, Fa'a Abdul Rahim, as you know, the books which many of you have benefited from, has written those books for Lighayri Natiqi, foreign speakers of the Arabic language, non-native speakers. Surprisingly, he said something to me when we talked about the approach of or the methodology of teaching foreign Arabic language speakers the Arabic language, what would the approach be? And he said to me, when we, that knowing that al-lughatul arabiyya is a means and a tool to master ilm al maqasid But he said that the approach and the methodology that is, uh, that is being adopted by many is that he said that one of the most bizarre things and the most crazy things that the Sheikh noticed in the West is that you have people who have never ever studied the Arabic language and there are people who are teaching them al ajrumi He said, this is craziness. He said that this person who is teaching al ajrumi to foreign Arabic language students doesn't have any knowledge when it comes to the Arabic language because that book was written for the native speakers whereas his book was written for the non-native speakers. So the approach to Turuq al-Tadris and the manage of the book is different. And I've seen so many people who have been teaching Ajurumiya, teaching to students when the, the structure of the book of Al-Ajurumiya is clearly for somebody who is a native speaker of the language. So this is why it's very important that appropriateness when selecting to study a subject you go and consult the experts in that field so that when you are studying Ilm al-Maqasid and when you are studying Ilm al-Ala they go hand in hand and you are on the same page and same page just like we have, I don't want to mention their names but you know in the West you see this guy teaching al Ajurbiya and the people who are Study the Arabic language and they're studying Ajun. It's crazy. He said to me, Shaykh Abdul Rahim said to me, oh, This is crazy. He said, He said, I have a, just to let the students know, I have a certificate, what do you call it, the, the Tefal or the Sultan of teaching English as a foreign language to non native speakers. So the approach of teaching English to those whose first language is not English is going to be different from the way our children who go to junior or secondary schools and they learn the English language, the approach is going to be completely different. So that's why you find students, they 
will enroll themselves on this Ajunomiya program and the guy who's teaching and he wants to just impress that he's such an eloquent speaker and he has so much knowledge so he's going to go into Ism, Fel, Harf and talk about it and talk about the, you know, the, the school of Basra and the school of Kufa. The non-native speaker is going to say, well, this Arabic language is too difficult to understand. I can't, it's not for me. So it's very important. And that day he mentioned to me and he said to me that uh, it's quite sad to see. I said to them that somebody who knows languages and Alhamdulillah I speak up to seven languages. I said, somebody who knows the structure and the function of languages will know that this approach is a foolish approach of of teaching text that was written for the Arabs to the non-Arabs. And that's why Fa'a Abdul Rahim's book has been a hit, a super hit, because the person who wrote the book was also a non-native speaker. He understood the culture and the language. That's why it's been a hit. That's why it's it's been criticized and critiqued. There's, everybody criticizes and has a, 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 a comment to make. But the matter of the fact is that the most of the graduates of Medina University that you may benefit from or that you may have taken your knowledge from is from Fa'a Abdul Rahim's book. And somebody asked me, just has asked this question now, and I will answer this question with regards to Al Arabiya to Bayna Yadayk. And I asked him this question. He said that Al Arabiya to Bayna Yadayk is a book that has been written to master conversation. And his book has been written and structured and constructed so that a person has a grasp of the Arabic language, so that he is able to understand ilmul maqasid from the Quran and the Sunnah. So the objectives are different. That's why he had a strong, he made some strong criticism on al Arabiya to me. And I've never liked the book al Arabiya to me. I said that there is another book which is better by, better than al Arabiya to me. Which is Al Arabiya to Nashi. Five parts, I believe, and that is a very good book because we have scholars from the subcontinent who are masters of the Arabic language, but they can't eloquently speak on the Arabic language because they've never lived in an environment where the language has been spoken. So they're very slow when it comes to conversing, many of them. But they will put the many of the Arab scholars to shame when it comes to their level of the comprehension of the Arabic language, especially in areas like Nahwa and Sif. So you just don't pick up a book because you see so many people studying it. In the West, especially, I'm talking about the West, but go back to an expert and see the positive and the negative comments, and then go back to your teacher, your mentor, and discuss that which is the most answer appropriate book for me. Someone like myself. Then we, like I said. So the beginner student of knowledge studies with the start studying the summarized and the abridged text, Muhtasarat. And he perfects he perfects the masail or the issues that he studies that are appropriate for him. Are befitting for him to to dwell into 
and to understand. Then he slightly, not too much, goes further into studying certain subjects of ulum al-maqasid, which will now be appropriate for him as being an intermediate student of knowledge. So now he has upgraded himself and he has moved a level up. After he has obtained a good amount of knowledge from the different subjects of Ulumul Ala. So he's got to study them hand in hand. <coughs> then as he is studying Ulumul Maqasid, and now he has moved from the foundational level to the intermediate level, that he chooses those subjects which are appropriate from Ulumul Ala, which is at the level of being an intermediate level of student. Until he reaches the level of being an advanced student in ulumul maqasid and ulumul alad, so this is the this is the, the, the path that he takes. Did, did we understand of how the people of knowledge have said of how things go hand in hand, and you can only be able to balance this if you go back to your teacher or the experts and study with the people of knowledge. Otherwise you will be lost. That's why we have a lot of lost students in the West. Somebody came to me once and he said to me that I want to study Ilm al-Takhreej with you. I said to him, Ya Talib al-Ilm, have you studied Mustalah al-Hadith? He said, bits and bobs. I said, then how can you study Ilm al-Takhrij? Takhrij is from the advanced level of students. I said, you want me to teach you privately when you don't attend my public lessons of Mustalah al-Hadith? So jumping, the level of jumping the gun, like they say, becomes a catastrophe. And now this student is able from, I advise him to come to my public lessons and I said, show some preciseness and some regularity when it comes to my public lessons. And then I will think about if you are able to grasp and understand maybe to teach you, try it. This is not going to happen over there. And he wanted there and then immediately. And then he thought that I was conceding knowledge. It's not a matter of conceding knowledge. The Sheikh, Bija Rahman al Abi, was not conceding knowledge. He was a busy man of what he was doing. And he has a condition and a criteria for somebody to come and study privately with him. When he sees that that criteria is fulfilled, he will open the doors of his house like he did. And somebody will study with you. So this is the, the, the balance that you need to understand also in some knowledge of Ilm al don't. Some people, they want to study Al-Usul al-Thalatha and Kitab al-Tawheed and al tahawiya and Wasatiya and it's all a cocktail. <laughs> and then when you ask them simple questions, they, and they said, I've studied everything. It's because the timing is not correct and it's above your level. That's a very important thing to understand. Are you understanding my students what I'm saying to you? I hope I'm not boring you, but I hope that I'm trying to make you understand why I have identified this problem in the West that why do we have more dropouts than most students of knowledge in the West. And then those who even try to seek knowledge they're all over the place. So this is what I advise the student of knowledge with. When the stu student starts with the foundational level, moves on to 
the intermediate level, then moves on to the advanced level by starting with ulumul maqasid and accompanying it with ulumul ala by selecting and knowing those subjects which are appropriate for him whilst he's studying that subject after he has reached that level then he has many opportunities in front of him when he has studied those subjects of how to advance in a certain area because it is not possible to master all the different areas and subjects at one time. This is not possible. If you think that this is possible, then you are mistaken. So the student of knowledge, he chooses that which he sees will be the, will be the most beneficial. Anfa. Which he sees will be the most easiest route for him. AC. And he sees that which is the most alpha, appropriate for his condition. These things are very important when it comes to seeking knowledge. Anfa, Asa, and Alpha. This is how the stone of knowledge decides once he has. That's why I say that the stone of knowledge should, should learn a text in every single uloom of maqasid from aqidah to tafsir to hadith to fiqh in every single ilm from the uloom al maqasid and this is the condition that I have when people ask me that so and so says he's your student I say naam he is my student in, the, in terms of him attending my lessons open to public, all of you who now, all of you are now technically my students in the sense that you attend and you study with me. But for somebody to be called my real student, then he must be somebody who has studied a text in all the main subjects of Ulum al -Maqasid. And with memorization. So for example, al bayqoniya is something which you need to memorize it. Usul al Hadith. So, you, you, after you, there are certain subjects which we have to study with, with no choice, meaning that you have to study those subjects. After you have studied that which is compulsory upon you, then now you have the right to choose of where you feel after consulting your teachers of where your interests lie. Somebody's interest may lie in tafsir of the Quran and somebody's interest may lie in ulum al-hadith. So that's why I said three things. Anfa, that which will be the most beneficial with regards to yourself. Asa, which you will find easy. You know, sometimes some people, they love studying the Arabic language because it's easy for them. But tafsir is hard. Some people, they love studying hadith. The aqidah is hard. So choose that which you feel, which you, after studying that which was compulsory upon you, the compuls compulsory su subjects, and then that which is awfaq, most appropriate for you and your condition. So, from amongst the students, we will have that Allah will open the heart of a student of knowledge when it comes to a particular subject. For example, this particular student, student A, his, he is really intelligent when it comes to ulum al-hadith. But the other students, they are not as smart as him when it comes to Ulum al -Hadith. So for this particular student, he should excel in that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made easy for him, which is Ulum al -Hadith. Due to him having a good grasp 
and benefiting from that particular subject rather than him busying himself by studying a subject which is going to be difficult for him. So for example, tafsir of the Quran is difficult for this student of knowledge. So he should leave out studying and specializing in tafsir of the Quran, but continue excelling himself in ulum al-hadith. This is very important. Are you understanding the point? So something which is appealing to you will not be appealing to another. Something which is going to be easy to you after you have studied the core subjects. You know, when you go out and study in a university, there are certain subjects you have to study and then you have the choice. You know, when you're in secondary school, they make you study maths, English, science, everything. And then when you get to a certain year, they say, okay, right now you have the options. Choose what you want to really study. Somebody might choose physics, somebody might choose chemistry. Now, but like I said, from Ulum al Maqasid, you will study all the different disciplines which are important to have sufficient knowledge in all those areas and then specialize in one of them. So you would have to know all the most important issues of Aqeelah. So you'd have to study quite a few books of Aqeelah. All. That is the first one that you should uh, study from uh, Ilm al-Maqasid. All Ilm al-Maqasid is obligatory for you to know until you are able to practice your religion. So, moving further on, O student of knowledge, you should know that there is a particular subject from amongst the subjects that if you were to look at that subject, then that, that subject is a, a, a lofty and a virtuous subject. But for a particular student of knowledge, student X, for him to expand and excel and go deep in this su subject, then that's not going to be appropriate or virtuous for him. Why? Because that student may have that difficulty in that particular subject. So although that subject is great, has a great virtue, but for that particular student, it's not going to be virtuous. So that's why you need to know that that student is not strong when it comes to perfecting. For example, let's take the subject of fiqh. When it came, comes to the study of fit, this particular student is not strong. He can't master it. He can't master the issues of fit. So, for example, he's not able to know that which is anomalous and that which is preponderant. So based upon this, it is better for him to not dwell in this subject, but he has a gift that Allah has given him, a, a malika, when it comes to studying the Arabic language. And he knows that if he studies the Arabic language, he will be able to grasp it very quickly. And he is able to identify uh, the issues of the Arabic language and be able to distinguish that which is correct and incorrect and that which is preponderant and that which is anomalous. He knows the references and the resources. He knows the books that he needs to go and research. This is all to do with the Arabic language then he should not study fit, rather he should engage himself with that which is anfa wa ajda, that which is more beneficial, and that which is more advantage, advantages for him. This all that I have discussed is when, when his intention 
is pure and sincere. And when he or she strives and works hard in obtaining that knowledge, then it is hoped for that type of a person that Allah will bless him in his knowledge and that his knowledge will be beneficial for the people. And for him to dwell into this type of knowledge will be fair for him. Then to dwell into those issues which he, not, which he may not be able to grasp and master. So do we understand what I said now? Do we understand the example that I gave of a student of knowledge who is strong in the Arabic language but not necessarily strong in fiqh? But he sees that everybody is studying fiqh so he pushes himself and, in, and enforces himself to study. This is not the right way of, of seeking knowledge. All knowledge is an ocean. You've got to decide from which side you want to dive into that ocean. So I'm going to tell you a story. Do you like stories? It's real stories. They say that sometimes, stories of the, of the self, by the way. <laughs> stories which are not Hollywood or Bollywood based or acting or lies or fibs, but real true stories from the self. So, the story which I want to mention is that there was an Imam of the Arabic language. There was an Imam of the Arabic language, Abu Abbas, Ahmad ibn Yahya al Shaybani, al Mulaqab bi Thalab. Abu Abbas, Ahmed ibn Yahya, he was he's famously known as Thalib. He is considered to be the Imam of the Kufi school of linguistics. He was born in the year 200 after Hijrah and he died 291 after Hijrah. Yaqut al Hamawi said that. He was a person who was a thiqa, trustworthy. And he had diana, he was a very religious person, he was an imam and authority when he came to the Arabic language. He had a student whose name was Al-Imam Abu Bakr ibn Mujahid. His student was born in the year 245 after Hijrah and died about 324 after Hijrah. So Abu, Imam Abu Bakr ibn Mujahid says that I was with my sheikh, with my teacher. And he said, he said to me, my teacher said to me, that, oh Abu, Abu, Abu Bakr, the people of the Quran studied the Quran and they were successful. The people of fiqh studied fiqh and they were successful. The Ahl al-Hadith, they studied hadith and the Allah granted them success. But me, what did I study? I studied with Zayd al-Amr. Zayd al-Amr is a common example that is used when you teach the Arabic language. So you say, Daraba Zaydun Amr. Ra'aytu Zaydun. Sallamtu ala Zaydin. Akala Zaydun. In the same way. So Zaydun Amr is always an example like we have X and Y. So when you look at the classical books of the Arabic language, when they want to use Examples, 
You know, like we say, excellent, wise, and then always use it. He goes, he said, look at all these things. Oh, look at all these great scholars of the Quran, of faith, of hadith. They spent their all their lives and they, Allah granted them success. And I, Thalib, what did I, what did I busy myself in? I busy myself in, in working out whether it's Zaydan, Zaydun, or Zaydin. He said, فَلِيدَ الشَّعْرِ مَا يَكُونُ حَالِ فِي الْآخِرَةِ Because I wish I knew what's going to happen to me in the Akhirah. What about me? What's going to happen to me? Abu Bakr Ibn Mujahid, he said, I left my shaykh, I left it and I went home. And he goes, that night I saw the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in my dream. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said to me, He said, Aqri' Abu al-Abbas anni as-salam. Give my salams to Abu al-Abbas, meaning Thalib. Wa qul lahu, innaka sahibu al-ilm al-mustatil. That indeed, you are a person of knowledge. Knowledge which is mustatil. Mustatil is that type of knowledge which spreads all for, which is a type of knowledge that has spread all over the Muslim world. And that, that, that knowledge which has been spread, the people have benefited from it. All the people. Ahlul Tafsir, Hadith, Fiqh, and other people. So Thalib, he visited himself in that which he knew he would master. And now we find today, in 1442, that the ulama continuously till our day they benefit from the knowledge of Thalab in the Arabic language. Consider him to be an authority, an imam, a great imam. And when it comes to dispute, his decisive ruling is transmitted and presented forward. And they use his explanations to understand tafsir and hadith and strange words which are not known. They say, look at what Imam Thadim said. What an amazing story. Subhanallah. So, the sunnah of knowledge must understand that not everybody can become like Al Bukhari. Thalib. When did he die? 291. Contemporary of Imam al Bukhari. But he busied himself in learning about the Arabic language. And look at today what, what his position is. Tafaddali. The world was speak. Look at his position today that Thalib is an imam of the school of Kufa when it comes to the Arabic language. And his knowledge, you will find his statements in books of hadith, fiqh, usul, everything. When it comes to investigating and solving issues of the Arabic language. So he wondered and he said to his student, he said, look for me, I spent all my life worrying about Zayn and Amr. Are you following the story? Do you understand the moral of the story? Or are you still lost? Maybe today's lesson has not inspired you or made things clear to you. Allah knows best. But all of us know our level and know our interest and know where we should be headed towards when it comes to seeking knowledge. Not all of us can become bin Baz, become like bin Baz and Albani, Ibn Uthaymeen. Ibn Uthaymeen, what is he known for? Huh, who knows? Ibn Uthaymeen is known for fiqh. 
Sheikh Al-Bani is known for what? Hadith. Sheikh bin Baz is known for what? Aqeedah. That's why they say that on the, in the final Hajj of when Sheikh bin Baz, Sheikh Ibn Uthaymeen and Sheikh Al-Bani met and they were in the same tent, Sheikh bin Baz would be asked a question. If the question was with regards to hadith, he would say to Sheikh Al-Bani, answer it. If a question was on fiqh, he would say to Sheikh Ibn Uthaymeen, you answer it. And if a question came on aqidah, Sheikh bin Baz would answer it. But Allah blesses some scholars to master everything. Very few of them I have seen but I have read that they say such scholars, every single subject, it was as though he was an imam in it. And from amongst them is Sheikh al-Islam Naam ibn Taymiyyah. And after Ibn Taymiyyah, somebody close to our era, Sheikh al-Islam Sayyid Nadir Hussein al dahlawi This is why they called him Sheikh al-Kul fil Kul. Why did they call him that? Nobody knows. They called him Sheikh al-Kul fil Kul. Because every single science that he spoke about, he said to the students, I have equal knowledge of it. And he gave him anything. In everything, every single science, hadith, fiqh, usul, usul al fiqh, mantiq, everything, ilmul kalam, everything. They say that they have not seen a man like this in 300 years. In everything. They asked him with regards to the Arab of the Quran. He said, they asked him, Shaykh, how, how do you find the Arab of the Quran? He says, I find the Arab of the Quran. With the mercy of Allah, just as I see my palm, that's how easy it is for me to make a rab of any ayah of the Quran. Give me an ayah and I'll make it a rab. So our aspirations should be like Shaykh al-Islam saying that it was a that these should be our aims and our aspirations. A rab is when you are able to identify and break down the Arabic sentences of the vowels of why there's a fatha dhamma and kasra on this. To, able, to be able to understand and justify. This is a And if I was to tell you some stories, and I will tell you some stories about him to inspire you. Shaykh al-Islam say, Nadir Yusuf Dahri wa rahimahullah. Ibn al-Qayyim. Ibn Taymiyyah. And great scholars before them. And somebody who is close in our time, about 200 years ago, 200 years ago, is the Indian great scholar, Sheikh al-Islam, Sayyid al -Dusa. That's why they call him Sheikh al-Islam. And that's why his students, they, they, were, they had mastered many of the subjects, not only one particular area. So we have, for example, Sheikh Sari al fawzan somebody is asking, he's known for Aqeel. Sheikh Fawzan is known to be an authority in Aqeel. Aqeel being his first major and the fiqh of the Hamadi Madh being his second major. Sheikh al-Islam Sayyid Nadiru Sandahlawi. Sheikh Suleiman al-Rahili is known for usul al-fiqh. For usul al-fiqh, his speciality is usul al-fiqh. Now, somebody is asking that was Hafiz Gondalbi a master of hadith or everything? He was a master of everything. There was a time in the Indian subcontinent that that particular period to the time of, of Gondalbi, rahimahullah ta'ala, that those who graduated in that era and studied with the scholars, they would master everything. That's why you found that the Arabs, they traveled back to the subcontinent to study because they were amazed. Now, they even mastered the mothers. Nadir Hussain Dahlavi was acknowledged by the Hanafis of being a great master of the Hanafi madhab than Hanafi scholars. So that a Salafi scholar being 
more knowledgeable of the Hanafi mother and acknowledged by the Hanafis, attested by the Hanafis. Now, the chat is asking me about every single scholar. They, they are not. Now, Sanaullah Amritsari was also a master of all the subjects. That's why when you see Sanaullah Amritsari, of over hundreds of books that he has written, he has written a book on every single subject. I was looking for a book on Usul al Fiqh. Now, and from amongst them, the last that we saw who had a great grasp of all the subjects was our Shaykh Mufti Muhammad Rais Nadwi Rahmatullahi. Now, when he talked about comparative religions, we thought Zaki Naik was like a Mickey Mouse in front of him. As people consider Zaki Naik to be a great scholar of comparative religions, when you read in some of his readings, when he talks about Christianity and Hinduism, that's why they say that one of the best books that he had written was Al Yahud fil Quran in 2000 pages, which is lost. The Jews in the Quran of 2000, almost 2000 pages. So, I don't know how much time has passed now, but uh, we need to know with regards to our priorities, our interests our goals and our aspirations and also our limits and by this we are able to draw that balance after studying. So the first object of all of you students is, is that you must study every single discipline from Imbul Maqasid. Have a taste of all the subjects and study a text with that and at the same time you are studying a subject from Ilmul Ala to help you master that Ilmul Maqasid. So, this is what we find. So, it is appropriate for the student of knowledge to be aware that he does not deeply engross himself in studying the tools or the mediums, medium subjects, because that could be a reason which will deprive the student of knowledge from reaching his goal, which is to master the subjects related to Imbul Maqasid. So we have some students who start learning the Arabic language and they know that the Arabic language is a means and a medium to master the Imbul Maqasid. But they engross themselves so much that the means become the goals. So for example, a student of knowledge preoccupies himself of studying a student from uh, a subject from Ulum al Ala. And then he engages himself by studying this and does not study anything from Ulum al Maqasid. Where his intention originally was. That he will study this ilmul ala so that he use so that that ilmul ala aids him of understanding ulumul maqasid. So, for example, let me give you a beautiful example. So, a student of knowledge decided that he wanted to study Arabic poetry. Okay, studying Arabic poetry. Does everybody know about Arabic poetry? So you have Arabic poetry which is pre-Islamic, no? Shahab al-Jahili. So he started to study Arabic poetry so that he could use that as a reference and proof and evidence of mastering the Arabic language so that he is able to understand tafsir, words of hadith. But his dedication devotion, deep devotion 
in the study of Arabic poetry and dwelling and diving into this subject to such an extent that he became preoccupied with this and he did not study tafsir or tafakkuf in hadith. So this became a reason for him to be deprived of by exceeding the boundaries of studying the medium and being tried with it rather than studying and mastering the medium for the real objective which was to study ulum al maqasid Understand? So we have to draw that balance. We have to draw that balance that he ended up studying. He wanted to know be competent in Arabic poetry so that he's able to understand the constructive mechanism of Arabic language sentences so that he's able to have a grasp on that so that he can understand the functions of the Arabic language so that he's able to understand the speech of Allah and the speech of Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa the sunnah, the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa That was his objective when he started but and that was from Ilmul Ala. So it is dangerous when Ilmul Ala becomes Ilmul Maqasid. The person is lost. And that's what we find a lot in the West. People are focusing on one particular individual I heard, and he's talking about such issues of linguistics of the Arabic language, teaching tafsir, that he's teaching everything and he's mentioning everything but tafsir. People are saying, oh, what an amazing tafsir. It's got nothing to do, it's just about the Arabic language and this and that, and blah, this and blah, 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 blah. So be aware, students of knowledge. Do not turn ilmul ala into ilmul maqsir because ilm, of, of ilmul maqsir or ilmul maqasid because you will be deprived of knowing. And I'll give you another example and we'll, we'll, we'll finish it here and what the You see, you have to understand that when you have knowledge of ulum, when a person Inshallah, I will answer these questions but before we get into these questions, let me tell you another example of differentiating between ulum al-maqasid and ulum al-ala and making sure that Ulum al-Ala is not taken as being from Ulum al-Maqasid. Somebody asked a good question before I finish the discussion. That Tha'lab. Tha'lab mastered the Arabic language, but he did study Ulum al-Maqasid. He did not neglect them. He had sufficient amount of knowledge of all the ulum al-maqasid and then he mastered the Arabic language you by giving you the second example do we understand the difference let's not mix up Fadab's example with the example that I gave you have a uh, objective that you want to master the Arabic language so for example a lot of people I'll give you a beautiful and practical example people learn want to learn or start learning the Arabic language why so that they can understand the Quran and the Sunnah. Yes or no? Yes or no? But you find that so many of the people, many of the people, they focus on conversation. So they started seeking the Arabic language to understand the Quran, but now they're just focusing just on mastering conversation. They want to be able to speak the Arabic language so much, and they dwell so much, and that's all their time, effort, and everything. Is gone into that, that that was a means, was ilmul ala has not become the ilmul maqsad for them. And they, didn't end up, they did not end up studying aqidah or tafsir or anything. Thalab studied these subjects, but then he chose to specialize in this because that was more befitting for him. Did he not have that doubt? But the people of Quran say Quran, the people say, because it was befitting for him because he had studied that which was obligatory upon him, and then he knew that this was more befitting for him. 
He didn't neglect the ilm al-maqasid. And he did not change ilm al-ala to be from ilm al-maqasid. So the reasoning with Thalab does not make sense if you understand the moral of the story. <laughs> so another example is is some of the students of knowledge they busy themselves with business and they say that I'm going to go into business and I'm going to earn enough money which is going to help me and aid me to seek knowledge meaning that I'm going to start a business and with this business I'm going to be able to seek knowledge but as soon as he enters into the arena of business he's trial within it so this was now ilmul something this was an like ilmul al that he wanted to obtain and start a business which was a means and a tool a means and a medium for him and with the money that he was able to get, he said, you know what, if I have my own business and I make good money, I don't have to work on a 9 to 5 job, I'm going to try to seek knowledge. But then he started making a lot of money or he started getting into his business. He just engrossed himself. And then he just expanded and he just focused on his business until his objective was lost. Which was that he, with this business, was able to seek knowledge. And do we understand the example? So do we understand now that the business which was like ilmul ala became the ilmul maqsad? First it was to earn enough money. So I don't have a 9 to 5 job, I can attend this class and attend this class and do seek knowledge here and learn this. So I want to earn, earn enough amount of money so I have a peace of mind. But then that earning money and that business became the objective and and seeking knowledge which was supposed to be the main objective was sidetracked and never happened. So that's where you have to draw the fine line. If you understand what I mean. I don't know if the, if the students have really understood what I'm saying. I'm going to give the last example. And the last example I'm going to give which is the most dangerous and the most fine example is that when you find some of the servants of Allah they busy themselves with the voluntarily acts, the nawafi, which they really love and they have a passion for doing them. To the extent that they do so much of these voluntarily acts, for example, raising money for charities is a good example, for example, which is a from the acts of nawafi. But what happens? When it comes to the obligatory acts, you see them that they fall short, which Allah has made it obligatory. So they give preference to that which is not obligatory over, over obligatory. So they're raising money and doing everything, but they are not praying on, on time and they are not praying. Or they are not abstaining from haram. So they go to that extreme. And due to them giving importance to nawafil or wal wajibat, that becomes a reason of them being deprived from the barakah of time and action. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us and grant us afiyah. And may he guide us to that which is the firm way. And may he protect us from the misguidance of fitr. So this is a great example to give as well. Another example. You know, working for example, doing charity work, this and that, but leaving out that which is obligatory. So you see a lot of sisters out there, they want to help and do charity, charitable work, which is a good, good action. Sadaqah is... But you see that they are mutabarrijat. You see that they are free mixing with men. Uh, they are not properly covered. So that, that's obligatory. So focus is given more on these things than that which is obligatory. So ilmul maqasid is like al-dawajibat.
And ilmul ala from that perspective is like the nawaf, it has its place and its time. Now, so by this, these were just two or three comparisons that I wanted to give and we'll stop here for today. And I know many of you have a lot of questions. So there's so many subjects you're saying and then and inshallah, I will provide you with a list of books in Aqeedah and in the different subjects that you need to study from the foundational level to all the levels. So you have a list with you, bi'idhanillah, which has been recommended by the scholars, bi'idhanillah ta'ala. But today's uh, the highlighting point of today is that when we seek knowledge, this path of seeking knowledge, when we start this book, we need to realize why we are studying this book. Where are we gonna where is this book going to take us? And what we need to understand this book. Otherwise, I could have taught you now the book from the beginning, and none of these discussions would have happened. I don't know what your thoughts are. Now, all these things about becoming lazy and how to take notes, how to sit in a classroom, these were all come, inshallah, I had to I have to address the issues in their time. But the two highlighting points is, is that not understand the status of Ilmul Maqasid and Ilmul Ala. Both have their places. Don't make Ilmul Ala the Ilmul Maqasid. And when you study from Ilmul, the Ilmul Ala that you study, make sure that you go back to the people of knowledge because the subject or the text that you are studying has to have appropriateness. And when you have got to a level of formal study, which is a compulsive, um, compulsory type of study, compulsory type of study, then you can decide like Tha'lam or Bukhari or Albani or Bin Baz or Ibn Al-Taymin or what you want to specialize in. Now, so this is what I wanted to mention and we'll stop here. Uh, the next uh, lesson that we're going to talk about is the manifesting Vahirul Ilmi wa Batini. The manifested and the inner type of knowledge. Because knowledge is not just about theoretical, as people think that the Salafis only focus on theoretical knowledge. Now the Salafis talk about the inner type of knowledge, which is the knowledge of the purification of the heart, the to nafs. We do have, this is a great uh, role, and this is one of the main object, objectives of studying knowledge, which is to cleanse that this knowledge becomes a means to cleanse our hearts and to purify our hearts and that's when the heart becomes alive otherwise the heart is as good as being dead because if theoretical knowledge was the only objective then the professor who teaches at SOAS or at Oxford or at Yale is not different from us because he theoretically knows opinions and can write a paper on this subject and that subject and even probably teach you Surah Farad. But is that knowledge something which is going to um, make, bring his heart to life? His heart is dead. He is as good as head, dead. The faculties of hearing and seeing and listening are as good as dead. Because they hear, see, hearing, seeing, and listening, they hear, see, and listen to everything, but the, but, but the speech of Allah. So he's as good as being dead, the one who cannot or does not have the ability. And we will discuss this in our next lesson because I don't want you to think that Batun al ilm which is the knowledge of the heart, the actions of the heart, that we Salafis, we have nothing to do. We, this is one of the most important factors when it comes to our knowledge. And this is where we slacken. There is not enough importance given in the West. That's why a lot of people are from the deviated sects are, are, are under the impression that we reject this type of knowledge. We reject types of Sufism. Sufism is that which is rejected. Or those things which go are, are, which are contrary to the Quran, the tazkiyah to nafs is something which, part, which is part of our self and which is fundamentally mentioned in the Quran. 
and we find all of our scholars gave this importance. So that's going to be discussed that when you do seek this knowledge, like when you do study Al Usul al Thalatha, how will Al Usul al Thalatha have an impact upon your heart? How will it be able to get you closer to Allah? Not just theoretically understanding this is not the only objective to mastering and memorizing and this and that or refuting that. The most important thing is how this knowledge is going to have that impact upon our hearts. How are our hearts going to tremble and be washed and purified from this knowledge? How is it that when we study this knowledge, that when we say Allahu Akbar and we pray, we, we taste the sweetness of Iman in our prayers. And we feel that we are getting closer to Allah by studying this knowledge, by acting upon this knowledge, by cleansing our hearts. So we have Zahir al-Ilm wa Batinih, which is going to be our next dis- discussion bi Ta'ala. Now, the so you can keep your questions till uh, next lesson, bi'idhnillahi ta'ala. And uh, we shall answer them. We shall stop here, bi'idhnillahi. I know you have a lot of questions. Keep all your questions, bi'idhnillahi ta'ala. Tayyip. Naam, you may be excused, Osman. Barakallahu feek. So we end the lesson here. And you can... Uh, um, keep your questions and begin in light where we start our next lesson. We'll take the questions first and then we'll start with regards to in the Zahib or in the Mat. Begin in light out. But is that the Allah Khaira? Wa Nafa Abikum al Islam al Muslimi. Sallallahu subhanahu wa ta'ala. A yuafikum bi kulli khair. Wa ayyaj ala wa ayyaj alakum. وَبَارَكَنَا إِنَّمَا كُمْتُمْ السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته